Welcome to the Law Society Younger Members Committee Career Information Session Number 5, when Fiona McNulty speaks to Susan Webster about the possibility of setting up your own practice. Welcome everyone to the Young, the Law Society Younger Members Committee Spring Series. This evening's information session will be on setting up your own practice and we're joined by Susan Webster who has kindly agreed to share her experience and her knowledge in this. Susan is a sole practitioner in, in Kildare and she, as you may have heard there, just for anyone who's tuning in shortly before 7 p.m., Susan is also a super mom in her spare time. <laughs> So uh, I hope that this evening, as I've said, I hope it'll be an interactive session and we've lots of attendees uh, joining as we speak and I hope that anyone with any questions or anyone looking for information or pointers from Susan, you can feel free to use the chat function or the questions and answers function on Zoom. I'll start maybe Susan by asking you about your path to setting up your own practice. I don't know how soon after you qualified did you set up, but was it something that you always wanted to do? How, how did you end up setting up your own practice in the first place? Hmm. Um, just, I'm going to answer that now, but first I do want to say that um, when I come into my office, I still have this sense of wonder that this is my office, this is my practice. And I often, not all the time, but I often feel this, sense of it's it's a pleasure and privilege to be in this position um and to think that you know, that there are clients who come to me at probably one of the worst times in their lives I, I act in family law matters only and they're very vulnerable and they're telling me the most intimate details of their life and they are coming to me and I take that so seriously um and I never lose sight that that is such a privilege that people are coming to me and that sense of wonder of of, of having my own practice um, hasn't left me yet of course there are days when I think you know oh no there's an issue arising or there's a client or there's a colleague or there's something but for the most part it's absolutely wonderful to be in practice on my own and I would absolutely endorse it um, for anybody who's attending, I think you probably have an interest and I would absolutely say go for it. Um, how I came to being in practice, I came as sort of a, 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 I didn't come a straight route. I uh, did a law degree and then I went to King's Inns and I did their one year barrister at law degree course. And uh, prior, the summer prior to my deviling, I actually went to work in a solicitor's practice um, and I had never uh, worked in a solicitor's practice previously. I always thought that I was destined for the bar. And yet I found when I started working in the solicitor's practice, I absolutely loved it. I loved the hustle and bustle and the people who were around and the engagement with clients and being with the client from the very start of a matter to the very end of a matter and the satisfaction from that. I just really enjoyed it. I didn't enjoy the subject matter. It was a practice that did mostly conveyancing. And to be frank, if you gave me a title, I would like to wither and die rather than reading it. But I loved this, the practice of being a solicitor. Um, and so then I went and I did my deviling. And to be frank, I found it very lonely. And um, I found it uh, very... Um, hard it was I just found it lonely and hard and I think I discovered that the career at the bar wasn't for me so what law was your master practicing in criminal criminal yeah criminal prosecution and I really enjoyed it I enjoyed the subject matter of it I enjoyed my master was wonderful and other colleagues were wonderful I just found it quite lonely um and I felt that perhaps a career at the bar wasn't for me so I actually went back to the solicitor's practice that I worked in. They very kindly took me back and I worked there and I did the conversion course in Blackwell Place. And then I did a diploma in family law um, and I set up in the practice I was in, a family law department essentially. Um, and 
I really enjoyed that. And yet I had this sort of niggling desire in the back of my mind to set up and practice myself. I don't know where it came from. I have no family background in law. I have no family background in business. So I don't know where it came from. Um, but And so it was very surprising to me. But I decided that um, if I was going to do it, well, actually, I just I, I think in my head I was thinking I'd like to do it. I'd like to do it. And I was I did lots of practical things with the Law Society. They uh, on occasion run a setting up your own um, practice course, like a CPG course. I did that. I did a course with David Rowe from Outsource. I think the Law Society subsidized it. I think they subsidize. I think they still subsidize it. I looked at all of, if you look on the Law Society website, there's all the practical things that you can attend to, you know, to see what do you need to do to set up your own practice to ensure you're in compliance with regulations with regard to um, accounts and um, all of those things. So I looked at all of that and yet I was still hesitant. I don't, I don't know why. Um, and actually a tip I would have for people is try and engage with other um, business networks because while you're in practice as a solicitor and you may be a very good solicitor and you may really love being a solicitor when you're setting up and practice yourself you're also setting up a business and I think that was something that I found quite difficult to grasp initially I was thinking how will I do this and so I joined um, the local chamber of commerce and I joined the women in business network and both of those networks were huge supports to me, coupled with all of the, the practical things I was doing in the Law Society. Those three things really assisted me. Um, in the local chamber, I met other people who were in business and had been in business for years. And that really pushed me out of my comfort zone to try and engage in, in, in a business world. And I remember being at one of my initial meetings and one of the um, men there said to me, when are you opening and when are you starting in practice? And I said, well, I'm, I'm just, you know, going through my list and making sure that I have everything in order and I'm, I'm doing this and doing that. And he said, no, 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 you have to have a date. You just need to set a date and decide I'm opening on this date. And I was saying, oh, what if, not the, what if I don't have everything? You know, what if the lease isn't sorted? And, what? and he said, just set a date. And he was absolutely right, because you'll always find a reason I need to sort this out. Or maybe it was just me, but I found it was always I need to sort that out and get this in order. And he just said, set a date. And so I set a date and then I set up and practice. Um, and so I, I practice in the area of family law only. Um, oh, I should say before I set up and practice, I engaged with so the Women in Business Network. I found both them hugely supportive and a great um, outlet to discuss matters with other women who were in business. And then, as I said, third thing is I engaged with the local enterprise office and I did a setting up in, in business course with them and they were very supportive. And also I did. Um, they helped me with the business plan because I had never done a business plan before. Nobody in my family had either. So they helped me with the business plan and getting that in order. And then I set up in practice and decided I'd work in the area of family law only. And um, and it's been now eight, nearly nine years. And it's, it is wonderful. And I really mean that. I mean, there's always days, but for the most part, it is something I would absolutely say if you're interested in it, go for it. You won't regret it. My Actually, my only regret, and it's not really a regret, but my only real regret in one sense is that I didn't do it sooner. Um, you know, that I was thinking about it and mulling over it and getting all my ducks in a row. And really, I should have just went for it. Obviously, get your ducks in a row and make sure you're in compliance with all of the regulations and you have everything that you need um, to, to so that the Law Society allow you to set up and practice. But other than that, if you're going to go for it, just go for it. And how long were you in, how long were you working in the previous office post-qualification? Like when you were setting up on your own, were you relatively newly qualified or uh, well, your, as you said, your path in, into the role of a qualified solicitor was somewhat circuitous, but um, how, how newly qualified were you when you set up? So I did, um, I was in the practice, in the solicitor's practice from 2007. And then in 2009, I did the conversion course and I completed it in 2010. Um, 
and I think I was qualified, I think it was 2010, there was a period of six months that I had further that I had to do, so it was 2010 or 2011, and then I set up in uh, July 2012, 16th of July 2012. Really good experience as, yeah, this was the work, the day-to-day work of a solicitor, you had a good sense of it by then. I did. Now, the only thing I would say is I think that for a lot of trainees, because you're in, um, trainees are in um, practices, you obviously get, I didn't have that traineeship, so I didn't have that um, experience. But I think for a lot of trainees, they probably get a lot of experience in doing, you know, in their traineeship. Um, so I, you know, I know other people who've set up as soon as they qualified or other people who leave it 10 years or more, I think you will know personally yourself if you are, if you want to go for it and at what time. And when you think back then, Susan, um, is there anything that you think back on and say, God, in 2012, I wish I had known X, Y and Z. Is there any um, thing you'd like to travel back in time and tip yourself off to? Um, I think probably some of the practical things in respect of business, in the sense that um, when I started in practice, I took I rented an office. I took a lease on, on upstairs on, a, on the main street in Maynooth. And I probably didn't need to do that. Um, and if I had spoken to other colleagues or I, I, I may have known that, um, that I didn't need to take that office. It was a big financial undertaking. Uh, and at the start of practice, I probably could have used that money for other things. Um, and I didn't realize, you know, that there are lots of other options. Some people work from home. I didn't want to do that, but that as in, I didn't want my home address to be my office address, but some people do that and that's fine. Um, other people would have taken it. And, and th this is what I did after that, took serviced office. So it really cuts down on your overheads and you can work from home and you can maintain an, a, like a, an address and um, it's your business address and your post can go there and you can go over and work there. There's lots of different facilities and now I have an actual office, but it's a serviced office, I choose actually two serviced offices in service buildings. And um, so those practi practical things or that there are telephone services who can answer your calls. You don't need to answer your own calls. Um, you don't need to get a secretary initially if you want to, fantastic, but you don't have to. Um, you don't need to have receptionists straight away. Um, you know, all of those type of really practical things, dictation, if you don't want a secretary, but if you want, if you don't want to be doing your own typing, there are dictation services, there are virtual assistants, the whole array and host of practical things that can assist you setting up your practice uh, from the outset or even through the course of your career um, in practice. And I think those are the practical things I wish I had known at that time. The other thing is, I wish I had known that things ebb and flow and change over the course of your practice. Um, I very much thought, this is it, I have everything in order, this is my office, this is what, and actually, don't be afraid to let some things go or to let your, let your practice ebb and flow over time. I remember a colleague in one of the women, in the women's network I was involved in, who said to me that there are different times in your life when you can do different things. Um, and at the time I was very involved in lots of different things outside of practice. And, and that's something I would say, try and do that and get support in other areas of your community um, or, uh, or you know, from colleagues from the Law Society, et cetera. But I was involved in your Free, free Legal Advice Centre. It's wonderful. I'd endorse it to everybody. Try and, if you, if you can, try and help them out. I was involved in all, you know, women in business networks and I was involved in media and things, which I absolutely loved. But it doesn't have to be like that. Then I had a family and things changed and it's okay sometimes to let those things go and you can come back to them and they will come back to you. So, um, you know, don't be afraid to let something go and say, and don't be afraid to say yes. Say yes to things, even if you think you're not ready for them. Um, because I think a lot of us are inclined, as you've probably heard me say, you know, get your ducks in a row, have your list, check them off. Sometimes you really just need to say yes and go for it and be outside your comfort zone. Um, and then, and actually that leads me to the third thing is that be confident in your own ability and back yourself. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, when I started in practice, um, 
I didn't have um I didn't have commi- family commitments and since I had a husband, but sure it was fine, you know, if he was working well, I could work. I could work anytime and every time. It was absolutely fine. But don't be afraid to have confidence in your own convictions and to put parameters in place and say, no, I can't do this. And this is how I'm working. And I'm not working uh, late at night and I'm not working on the evenings. Um, and put those parameters in straight away because I have colleagues and it's so funny, actually. I remember when I started in practice, I have a colleague and her husband is Italian and um, she takes a month off every summer at the month of August. And everybody says, how can you take a month off? And she just does it. She says she she advises all of her clients. They're all aware she's away for the month of August. She's a lovely um, assistant who will keep things going and as much as you know needs to be. But she just does it. And I remember thinking, how does she do it? And actually, then it's funny how the wheel turns because I had started putting up on my office signature. You know, these are my holidays. The office is closed. I'm not going to be here. And another colleague rang me and said, how do you do that? And I said, you just decide to do it and you do it. Have confidence in yourself and put parameters in place. So that's the other thing. Yeah, well, I suppose that probably brings me on neatly to the next question that I had for you. And that is, is it possible to have a good work-life balance when you're running your own practice? I mean, at running any kind of a business, and especially when you're starting out, it's, it's tough going. It's, um, you know, you need to put a lot of energy into it to get it off the ground. But once you have it off the ground, once it's up and running, hopefully pretty quickly, is it possible to achieve a work-life balance? And, and what are maybe the drawbacks and the positives when it comes to work-life balance when you're running your own practice? Um. I think this is a question that's always asked of women. and It's not a criticism at all, because I think it's actually really important that we talk about this, because if we don't, then we don't kind of give each other uh, and, and men ideas about how how things work for women usually in life when they possibly get to a certain age and possibly want to have a family and all that that that, that entails. So I think it's always a question that, that's asked of women and um, uh, can you have a good work-life balance? Um, I think that being, for me personally, being in practice um, is the way that I can achieve the type of life that I want to achieve. And I think that's different for everybody. So I can really only speak to my personal experience and how things are for me. And can I just say, before I had children, I used to hate people. I didn't hate, but I used to go, oh God, roll my eyes and people would waffle on about children and their family. And actually now I am that person because honestly, they're the best thing um, that ever happened to me, you know, in life in general. And so, um, it's hard not to talk about a family and they're also little and all the rest. But so um, for me, actually, I'm involved in the Women in Leadership program with the Law Society at the moment. And so I'm a mentee and I have a mentor and I was talking to my mentor about this and she said something so interesting. It actually blew my mind and I hadn't thought about it before. She said, your practice has to exist to serve you. And I thought, what? This just blew my mind. I thought, really? Because sometimes we're all on such, and we're all on on a hamster wheel of running, get clients, you know, get fees. How are we doing all that we can? And in practice, you know, you're you're always you're either too busy or you're not busy enough. And if you're not busy enough, you're worried because you're where are the clients coming from? Are you ever going to get another client again? So you need to have confidence in yourself and in your practice once you've put in the hard legwork at the very outset to get to and you get a bit of momentum going and get to a certain stage. Um, but I very the other question that's always asked of colleagues and um, it's, I think just in the solicitor's profession is, are you busy? And this I hope this does not sound pretentious. It's not meant to be at all. I'm as busy as I want to be. I personally want to enjoy a family life and I want to spend time with my children and so that means I structure my work day around that um so I don't work nine to five Monday to Friday I work varied hours and I have good support systems in place in that my clients um know that if they ring a message will come through to me and um they also know that 
um, I have a very good assistant who can manage certain things and manage emails and things like that. So clients are never left unattended. Um, but I'm not at my desk, change my desk all of the time. And I want to spend time with my family and I want to be at home with them and I want to enjoy that type of life. So for me, can I achieve a work-life balance? I try to, and I think I've become better at it since I've had children. Um, and um, that's a decision that I made that how I want to structure. So, you know, everybody, I suppose, has to make that personal decision as to, you can work as much as you want. I mean, you, and so how do I do that practically? Because you could be at your desk all day, every day, you, you know, you're that hamster wheel trying to get clients in, trying to get fees in, trying to, so you have to make a decision. I know, and I've assessed over time, how many clients I can take on at any time and how much I can manage and not manage. And when it becomes unmanageable for me, um, you know, what do I need to do and to deal with that? So for me, being in practice myself, is the only thing that I would consider having a family, to be frank. And it, and I, I really enjoy my practice and I enjoy it because I know that I can manage it in that way and that I can have family time as well as being in practice. But I think that's something that as women and even men that as, as, as a parent, we really need to talk about because before I had a family, you know, breakfast meeting, no problem. Loved breakfast meetings, evening meetings, no problem. Loved evening meetings. Let's go for dinner. Lunchtime meetings, wonderful. And I think that our profession is now, isn't it 52, I think, percent, 53 percent female. And I know so many colleagues of mine who are all female and are all in practice themselves. And I think we need to be very vocal um, to say, I can't do that meeting because of this. And I'm not saying only because I have a family. I think, as in, I have young children, I have a four-year-old and I have twins or two, but other people have other commitments. So it is that work-life balance. It's not, it may not be work-family. Other people have other commitments. You know, you may have somebody who you care for at home. You may have an elderly parent. You may have a partner who you just want to be with. You may have other commitments. You know, you may be training for something or you may want to, um, you know, do something else. So I think we all have to be very conscious of that. And I'm really conscious now of having family pictures up and of saying to people, I can't do that because of this. And I say that because for younger women and men who want to have a family, I'm really conscious that, um, you know, I feel I've been around for a little while now. And so if I need to say that so that everybody else can say it. And actually, when you do say it, I find that colleagues and I mean, I'm on committees in the Law Society, I'm on the Family Law Committee and I'm the Vice Chair of the PR Committee. I find people are very flexible when you say, I can't do it because of this. And I used to be so reticent and I used to be so almost embarrassed. You know, it comes back to, oh, don't tell clients you're pregnant because they won't be happy. I really feel like there's no room for that in the profession at all. I think and I think we need to support each other and, and be vocal about it. And I'm very vocal and you can very visible about it as well. Um, so can you have a work-life balance? I think it depends what you want from your work-life balance. But I think that if you are in practice yourself, then you are you're the engineer of your own work day and work week and work year. So I think it's absolutely achievable. And for me, I wouldn't I would never consider going into employment um, because of the fact that I like to be able to manage my own diary and manage how I work or don't work if I choose. Sounds very, very appealing, Susan. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm waffling on. You're. I hope I'm not going on too much. Stop no, me at any time. You've a made a great case, I think, for uh, setting up your own practice and being the master of your own destiny. But also, I think, um, I don't know. I think there'll be a lot of people on the call will appreciate your sentiment of you know you have to see it to be it. And when you see senior solicitors like yourself saying, "I can't make it because I have this or that," it it empowers other people to maybe speak up and, and say what suits them and and like we discussed earlier you're bringing your whole self to work and and that we've some really good questions coming in on the chat and the q a and i might just do a quick uh, run through of them and see what do you think susan one question was how did you get your clients when you were starting off so when you first set up on your own you had your office in maynooth like how did you get clients in were you able to bring some with you from your old practice or did you advertise or how did you go about it 
I brought some in from my old practice um, and also I really got involved in the area. I actually had moved into Kildare. I wasn't from Kildare originally. We moved to Kildare. And so I thought, first of all, I better get some friends here. And second of all, I better get some clients here. So um, I became involved in local radio. I did a legal slot on the local radio. It was wonderful. It was great fun. I did it every week for four or five years. It's not as daunting as you think any of, any of us who are solicitors can do it. So I did that and that got me known in one way. Um, I was involved in a local women in business network and I became president of that and there were lots of events. Um, I From that and from the radio became, I, I kind of became known with the papers and I did a little bit of advertising. My website, which is not great at the moment, but website, a lot of people come through your website. Um, word of mouth, to be honest, word of mouth, it was all word of mouth. So that's what I'm saying, be, become become involved if you can in your local in the community in your local community or the community in which you're in practice and become involved in things that you're interested in and that you want to do but become involved um and and become in, i always find the law I, I you know become involved with the law society other colleagues were great for referrals because i only do family law there might have been you know a colleague who dealt with somebody for a will and then they you know they you know they were, so word of mouth ultimately but you have to put in the groundwork so i found um you know being involved and i suppose your website in one way and and someone was wondering you know you seem to have made a decision quite early on that you would specialize in family law someone was wondering is it hard to sustain a practice when you're so in such a specialist area or do you sometimes take work more general practice work absolutely not no not at all i did when i started in practice I, I decided I was going to do family law only because that's what I really enjoyed actually. And I felt if I was going to be working at it, I may as well enjoy. And I felt that was an area that I very much had an expertise in. Maybe that was naivety in, uh, at that time. But um, no, I did one conveyance for a friend when I started and honestly, it was the most stressful time of my life. Like it was all fine. Everything was in order, there's no difficulty, but really I just did not enjoy it. Is it hard to sustain it? Uh, no, I haven't found that. Uh, it, it takes a while to build up a practice. I'd say it took me maybe two years to kind of get things going to a point where I felt like this is, you know, this is what I can do. I mean, for the first year or two, it was fine. That, you know, you're you're getting through cases, but um, then it, then hopefully you see it starts growing momentum and you, you feel like, okay, this is something I can do. Um, and I very, funnily enough, I actually have specialized more and more and more and more and more as I've gone on. So at the start, I did all family law. I was in the district court. I was on the legal aid panel. That's something I'd say if you're starting practice, if you're on the legal aid panel, you know, um, the money isn't great. I don't know if I should say that or can say it, but it's, it's you know, it's, 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 it's not. And you might be in court lots and lots of times but it does get you out there and in the practice of doing things and being around other colleagues. And, you know, there might be a colleague there who's involved in something and then they, they might know that you're there and, you know, word of mouth and things like that. Um, uh, sorry. So, but, so I did everything. I did lots of district court work and I did, so anything in the district court, access, maintenance, guardianship, that type of thing. And then I did any circuit court applications or the the the, loop, the 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 wanted high court or higher work but then as i went on and on and on all i do now is a really separation and divorce in, in circuit court or higher i don't do any district court work i'm not in the legal aid panel so actually i have kind of streamlined down and down and down and down and i don't find it hard to sustain it but then again i mean i always say this it's the, the same when people ask me are you busy um I, i'm not you know um, um, I'm not a big practice. I'm not one of the the, the five golden circle firms, or I'm not, so. And I and there's only myself as a solicitor in the practice. So um, that's how busy I am, and that's kind of the level that I like being at, and that's the level I will you know keep going with. Um, but I don't find it hard to sustain uh, at all. And actually, um, you know, is it hard to just specialize? it's not I never find it hard to turn work away at all and I think that there's enough work in family law for all for all of us and you know there's clients for there's one there's particular clients for us and there's particular clients who are not for us so no that was my very long-winded answer to say I don't find it hard to stay yeah well there's a huge amount of interest in the chat function uh, about it Susan so I, I think if you're going to be talking at another event um it, within the law society on setting up your practice I think you'll have a few 
feel that already have a few people interested in signing up but we're just coming up to half seven now so I'm conscious um, that we'd be closing off soon and I wonder if you might feel that you would have that you might be able to have three top tips for someone who's on the information session this evening and thinking mm, I might you know I might think about that what are the three top things that they really need to think about yeah. just do it just just do it if you're interested go for it you will not regret it it is fantastic being in practice there are hard days there are lots of things that are hard about being in practice but in the main it's 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 absolutely wonderful and actually I always people always ask I was always interested in you know would you say to your child would you encourage them to go into your profession and not because they absolutely not I absolutely would encourage them and I would encourage anybody out there one just do it two we are a regulated profession make sure you attend to all of the practical matters that you need to attend to and get assistance if you need assistance. Don't be afraid to say, I need some assistance in this regard or in that regard, but make sure you follow everything that you need to follow and that you're in compliance with everything. And then the third thing is get involved. Get involved in um, other networks, in other business networks, get support from colleagues, get support from the law society, get involved in the law society and um, always, you know, pick up the phone. We're a very collegiate profession. You know, if anyone wants to pick up the phone, you, you know, you'll find my number, give me a call or give anybody else a call. I always find that we are very helpful um, to other colleagues. Well, Susan, thank you so much for a really honest account of setting up your own practice and your enthusiasm is infectious. So I'm sure you'll have lots <laughs> of people off this evening yeah. uh, thinking about what they might do and whether they'll just do it. So thank you so much again for your time. It's really appreciated. And um, I hope that uh, you will continue to prosper in Kildare.